Hey, 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 Bubblers! How are you all feeling? Welcome to BubbleCon 2023. I'm JV, Bubbles Director of Community, and we're so, so excited to have you here with us here in New York City, and also to those of you who are tuning in online. Uh, welcome to New York. We are live from New York City. <laughs> uh, we're going to kick off um, BubbleCon with welcome remarks from our founders, Josh and Emmanuel. Hello, everyone. So my, my name is Emmanuel Strashnov, and I'm one of the Bubbles co-founders and co-CEOs. And I'm Josh Haas, the other co-founder and co-CEO. And on behalf of the entire Bubble team, welcome to BubbleCon 2023. Thank you all for being here today. There are hundreds of people in this room and thousands tuning in from home. We feel incredibly lucky and humbled to be supported by so many of you. Bubble would not be what it is without you. This community is really, really special. And we couldn't be more excited to get together for an event like this for the very first time, especially here in New York, where we all got started uh, 11 years ago now uh, and where we still headquartered today. So we're here to learn, to get inspired, and connect with one another, uh, united by our shed love for innovation, no-code, and bubble. We have a really great lineup of sessions planned for you today and tomorrow. You're going to hear from tech industry leaders on how AI is shaping no-code's trajectory, startup founders building successful businesses around their bubble apps, and, of course, plenty from us and the bubble team on the future of no-code and bubble itself. But first, we're kicking things off with something that's very special to us, uh, to Josh and I and the entire Bubble team. We started Bubble 10 years ago because the world is full, of, is full of good ideas. We wanted anyone with a good idea to have the tools they need to bring it to life, regardless of whether they know how to code, regardless of where they live in the world, regardless if they're able to hire a team of developers. Bubble exists to make it easier for anyone to become not just a consumer of technology, but also a creator of technology. We believe that's the only way technology can make the world a better, more inclusive place. And, and as we grew, we wanted to set up something that would make this mission even more vivid to everyone. And so back in 2020, we started thinking about ways we could assist a set of group of founders in a more engaged manner than giving our product uh, for people to use. And that's called Immerse. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. So pre-accelerator program uh, available for founders who are coming for underrepresented uh, groups, you know, in tech and in venture capital. And our goal is to assist them over the course of eight weeks to not only learn how to build a product and uh, learn how to run a business, but also to actually get the product up and running uh, on Bubble, obviously. And so today we're excited to introduce you to our six cohort. Um, and there are a few fun facts about them that I wanted to share. Uh, the founders you'll meet tonight, or meet today, like in, in a few minutes, uh, that are sitting here, are coming from as far as Mexico, the United Kingdom, uh, California, and Vermont. And they're aged age from their 30s to their 60s, and have been operating their businesses from three months to four years, so pretty wide range. And most importantly, this is the first cohort in Immerse history that is a women-only cohort. <laughs> yes. Bubble being about democratization, it's very important to also make sure we have everyone you know, represented uh, in the Bubble community. Um, and so the Immerse program culminates with Demo Day, uh, which is what we're doing today, which is the pitch competition for the best project that we had in the class. Uh, and there are three prizes, uh, so best product, best demo, and community favorite, and that's where you all come in. We figured what better to kick off these two days of building community and celebrating good ideas than have to all of you help us pick that winner and the community favorite. So we are holding our first ever in-person demo day right now. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Nicole Bestman, our Director for Founder Inclusion, to run this. All right, all right. Thank you so much, Emmanuel and Josh. And so like they said, my name is Nicole Bestman. I lead Founder Inclusion Efforts at Bubble. And first, I want to talk a bit about why we're actually here, right? So first thing we're celebrating here is entrepreneurship and no code. 
So if you've built anything in a bubble, you have experienced what the Merce founders have in just a condensed period of time. So the first thing they've experienced is speed, right? So we had one founder in particular who cited that in a self-imposed sprint of two weeks, he actually built 80% of his MVP during that time, right? We also are experiencing or actually celebrating the agency that comes along with building in bubble as well. So again, if you've built anything in bubble, you have felt that sense of ownership and control, right, with being able to implement something at the drop of a dime. And we're also celebrating a major milestone when it comes to immerse in women as well. So in particular, <clears throat> last year, according to PitchBook, only 2.1% of the companies that were actually funded by VCs last year were women-led startups. And so that wouldn't be a big deal if, in fact, women since 2019 were the primary demographic of individuals who are actually starting businesses here in the United States, right? So it's really important for us to be at the forefront of that, given our mission. And so given that, we're celebrating a milestone. So this is our sixth cohort, as Emmanuel mentioned. But in fact, this is our first cohort of all women. So can everyone give a round of applause, please, at that? <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about what happens next. So you will hear from four individual finalists, phenomenal finalists, if I do say so myself, um, who are in fact building in wildly different spaces and very different solutions. So we have Deb, who's building for disaster management. We have Vice, who's building for early education, Princess for alumni management, and Anna, who's building for wellness and tech for pets. And you'll also vote your own community favorite as well. So that's our favorite part of the evening because not only are our judges going to be making decisions, you all will be as well. And you're also going to hear from our previous fan favorites. So this is probably going to be one of my favorite parts of the evening because if you caught our previous demo day, you voted yourself for Obi Chaguma. And she's back again today to talk about what happens after Immerse. What does the trajectory look like when you're trying to go it alone, solo, building a business, which many of you in this audience actually have experienced, especially uh, the folks here who started agencies. And for those of you who are online, you're going to be in for an even more special treat because not only are we showcasing and debuting our finalists, but you'll also get the opportunity to tune in online and hear four more additional pitches and products that we'll be debuting for the very first time. And so I want to give them a major shout out because it's not easy, right, to build something and debut. So Ale from Dreambait, uh, Emily, who's the founder of Veal Justice, Nicole, who's the founder of Learnal, and Spencer, who's the founder of Tech Forward Solutions, will also be debuting in the Expo Hall. So please make sure that you take the opportunity to check them out. So what exactly is Immerse? Um, if you haven't attended a previous demo day, you might be wondering, what exactly is it that we do? Right, so we're a product-first pre-accelerator where we are really dedicated to equipping underrepresented founders, historically underrepresented founders here in the United States, um, with the skills to build an app in just eight to 10 weeks. And so underlying all of that is this principle that we had that founders are their company's first product managers. And what exactly do we mean by that, right, when we say they're their first PMs? It means that if you decide to go it alone and build something and roll up your sleeves, right, and build in bubble, you will be the one who's tasked with talking to customers, right? I'm sure all of you in this audience have done that. You're talking to customers, you're gathering requirements, right? You're building the first version of something that's tangible that hopefully solves the pain points. And so how exactly do we do that? We have three main pillars of our program. The first is Bubble Core. So in Bubble Core, we're teaching you the foundations of how to build on Bubble along with some advanced principles. And so you might fill out a product brief where we're helping you organize your thoughts and your requirements and get an understanding of what you should prioritize in terms of how you spend your time in the program. We also have our product core pillar. And in our product core pillar, you'll take care of some of like the pretty things, right? Like primary colors, secondary colors, what should your assets look like, fonts, those kinds of things, the UX UI side of things. You also fill out a product roadmap, again, prioritizing, helping the founders understand at minimal, what do you need to know as a solo, solo entrepreneur in order to build an app and sustainably build it over time? And in our product's core pillar, our product, uh, in our product's core pillar, our founders meet other founders, other funders, right? Uh, other individuals that can support them along this journey of building a business. And so my favorite part of our program actually is who supports our founders. And so major shout out to Emmanuel and Josh who open up our cohorts, close our cohorts, and then also we tap into our bubble team, right? So we have Laura, Missy, Peter, who all came and talked to this cohort about product design, product management. How do you go about doing research, uh, user research actually as a, a solo entrepreneur? We also had past founders, Immerse Esfra in particular is currently raising funds after completing our program last year. 
and Simone who talked about how to 2X and 3X yourself in your own operations as you're running a business. We also have our product mentors, which some of you are here tonight, and I want to give a major shout out to all of you because truly you are an integral part of our uh, organization and our programming. So huge shout out to Kim, V, Brian, Harish, Bernadette, Kieran, Jose, um, also James, Michael, Trang, Kelly Claus, who's also here tonight, who's our instructor. Um, and then also Andrew, Maria, and Sam, who's part of Bubble's home team, right? They provide office hours every Friday to, again, offer that technical help. They're in the back there. Major shout out to you guys for offering that technical help. And lastly, Paul as well, who offers up design consult consultations to our founders. And so we're at the time of the night where I'm also going to introduce our judges who are going to be making some really tough decisions tonight. And I can tell you because you have some wonderful product demos you're going to see in a moment. So first up, I want to introduce Alan Yang. Alan Yang is also part of the home team, head of uh, product development here at Bubble. Woo woo. So Alan is our VP of product at Bubble. He joined four years ago as the first product hire. Um, after product management roles at Google, Better Mortgage, and Yipit. Based in New York City, he enjoys building products of his own, which is one thing that attracted him to Bubble, a product that democratizes the ability for anybody to create a software idea that they have. So Alan will be bringing both the product lens and the technical bubble lens. The product lens means thinking about the user, their needs, the positions, uh, the proposed solution, and how those all match up. It also means gauging whether an idea is both viable as a product and business, as well as valuable to the user. The bubble lens is about assessing what's gone into the creation of the app itself. And so, Alan, thank you for joining us. Will you tell us a little bit about why you're here? Sure thing. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. It is so exciting to be here at the first ever BubbleCon. It's been a long time coming. Um, I've already met uh, a number of people out front who came up to me, and the first thing they said was, I have been looking forward to this for the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long time to be waiting for PubbleCon. Um, but anyway, thank you all for being here. Um, honestly, the enthusiasm is contagious. Um, knowing that all of you are out there and knowing that so many of you love the product is what really you know, fuels and inspires our team. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Next, we have Amelia Miller, who is representing, she's, a, she's an investor, actually, at Bubble, Bubble's own investor, Insight Partners. Thank you, Amelia, for joining us. So Amelia is an investor at Insight Partners, <laughs> where she focuses on early and growth stage opportunities and leads the firm's responsible AI efforts. Amelia previously worked on the data analytics team at CNN in the office of Senator Elizabeth Warren and at the Atlantic. Amelia will bring an investor's perspective to the judge panel and asking key questions around what founders should think about as they prep for conversations with institutional investors and prep for scaling their businesses. So Amelia, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you all for being here. It's great to see so many users after leading Bubble Series A back in 2021. So it's been many years of tracking the journey from afar and it's just so great to actually talk to people who use the platform and see the value that we saw in it when we led the deal back in 2021. So excited to be here and to meet more of you after. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Kabina Ansa, who sits on the pre-VC startup team at AWS um, and actually supported the launch of the AWS Impact Accelerator. So Kabina is a seasoned entrepreneur and a finance professional dedicated to serving overlooked markets. As a biz dev manager for AWS's startup team, he provides strategic guidance and mentorship to founders and top accelerators and incubators across the United States and Canada. Prior to joining AWS, Kavina was CEO of Cover, a platform he founded to provide working capital, customized for gig economy workers with over 10 years of experience in banking and specialty lending. At Wells Fargo and Modern Lend, he was continually focused on creating financial products for underserved segments. Kavina studied finance at Cornell and entrepreneurship at Wharton, honing his passion for bringing innovative financial solutions to overlooked markets. With first-hand experience as a founder and now mentoring over 200 startups annually, Kabina has an in-depth understanding of the entrepreneurial journey, and on the panel, who provide insights on key factors that set high-growth companies apart from those typically less likely to succeed. So, Kabina, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here to see these awesome founders who are disrupting spaces across 
education, animal well-being, building of networks, and at AWS have the opportunity to meet with many different companies, many of which built incredible foundations and the starts of their MVPs through Bubble. So really excited to see uh, the awesome companies that are going to be shown tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So before we go on to the judges, um, and actually the judges deliberating on what we're going to see tonight, let's talk a little bit about where you come in. So there's three things I want you to do. First, follow along and take notes. So if there's a product or a founder here that really resonates with you, you think maybe there's someone in your network that they should connect with, take note of that, right? And connect with the founders during networking afterwards. Secondly, all of you should have downloaded Hopin. I know everyone here has. Um, we're going to be throwing out some polls throughout the evening, right? So download it answer those polls. We want this to be as interactive as possible. And lastly, we want you to spread the word. So I'm sure all of us here had that friend or family member that's been talking about the same business idea for the past five years, right? So maybe they'll be inspired by what they see tonight, especially given this group and who they are and how fantastic. And they showcase that anyone can build in Bubble and anyone can learn in Bubble. Um, we want to make sure that if you have that friend, you are tweeting out and talking about what's in you here today. So just use these hashtags. Do me a favor. Hashtag Immerse Founders. Hashtag Immersive Bubble, and hashtag BubbleCon 2023. And with that being said, we're going to call up our very first finalist of the night, and I know we're going to have a thunderous applause for Anna, who's building in Bubble to strengthen the bond between human dog families. So Anna, come on up. You got this. You got this. Okay. Hello, everybody. It is so special to be here, and especially with my cohorts who we have worked very hard, and we're very happy to be able to introduce all this work to you. And so I hope you enjoyed my presentation. So I'm Ana Saldana. I'm excited to be here. I'm the founder of Muji. This is a human and dog wellness app. So I have to make a question to everybody. How many of you have pets? Raise your hand. Wow. A lot of people have pets. <laughs> Oops. I'm trying to switch to my slide, but it's not working. Yes? <laughs> OK. We got it. So you raised your hand, and you're like the whole world. The world loves pets. Pets are on the rise. There are 1 billion pets in the world, and 50% of the world has a pet at home. This is an irreversible trend. Pet ownership is rising globally. Millennials and Gen Z account for more than 60% of pet ownership. One in three homes has a dog, and 90% of dog owners consider their dog part of the family. But this is not only about the amount of dogs. Pet owners are big spenders. For example, Nestle's half-year results reported pet care as their biggest growing category. It grew 15% when the all-around growth rate was 8.7. And this is because the market keeps on growing. We will launch in Mexico, but this is a global trend around the world. There are more dogs in homes and less babies. In Mexico, for every baby in a home, there are 18 dogs. In the US, there are 24 dogs for every baby in a home. So who is my buyer persona? Meet Max and Diego. Um, Diego is a millennial. He's single. And in his life, it's a must to love Max. If you don't love Max, he's not going to be your friend. And Diego is never able to take Max to the vet when he needs it which usually means that whatever problem he has is made worse because he has to wait a few days. For example, if Max eats a toy, he just eats it, and if it's like here, they'll say like, oh, let's go to a bed, and the bed can do something quick about it. But what happens if he's waiting like for two, three days, and the toy is just <laughs> traveling along? And what it means is that eventually, he's going to go to the vet, and he's going to require surgery. And so what does this mean? There's a cost in delaying vet um, visit, and it has a big impact on Max's health. And Max is spoiled, misbehaves, but Diego believes all dogs misbehave, right? 
And even if Diego it has big headaches with Max, all Diego wants is Max to be happy and live a long life. So life is wonderful with dogs, right? But in a second, it can all change and get out of control. Just look at all the Band-Aids in scratches on his arms. The inexperienced dog owner really is put through the ringer, and we want to change that. We want to take dog care to the next level and address the biggest pains. We have talked to more than 1,700 dog lovers, launched our MVP Zero, and have, from all our learnings, found four solutions to the biggest pains. One, health. Self-online diagnosis with AI for non-emergency triage and video vet calls. Two, training. Develop training tailored to human based on time, physical space, and behavior oriented. Wellness tools. We, are, we have developed a mood monitoring of humans and dogs to identify patterns and tailor activities to their needs. And we want to create habits for longevity. This means stress reduction for a better quality of life for both humans and dogs. So we are convinced that with technology, science, and having a data-rich approach for a profound knowledge of our users, we can change their lives. So how does Muji work? We are asset light. Humans can pay as you go or subscribe to a membership plan with some perks. For vets, it's another story, and that's like a whole different app, but we also built it on Bubble. And the idea is we are creating the Uber for vets. We plan in the future to expand to other latitudes, more pets, all kinds of services, create the first fully functioning dog passport, increase the research of human dog science, but finally and most important, connect in virtual and literal sense dogs and humans. Yes, connectivity is everything. Current developments in dog wellness will allow for dogs to have a chip inserted under their skin and provide real-time information on their health, and this will connect them with a human. But there are other ways to be connected through their moods combined with their health data. They will receive personalized programs, and you will, able, will be able to connect with like-minded people in our community. We are about building predictive tech throughout what we do because we want humans and dogs to live a better and happier life. And I could not have a presentation, and you will all agree if you have a dog, you probably have more pictures of your dog on your cell phone than your own, uh, without introducing you to Kala. She's a mischievous three-year-old border collie and my co-founder. I'm a lawyer, ex-management consultant, worked for the last 18 years as a host and producer of my own TV cooking show, and I'm a member of the Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. And talking about co-founders, we are building a team of serious dog lovers. Please sign up on our wait list and download our app. We just got approved at the Google Store today, so we're going to start testing it. And so I would love to have uh, more testers. Please sign up on our wait list. Tell your vet friends to contact us. We are looking for a CTO growth and data scientist. And if you loved our idea, we are always looking for angels or investors. <laughs> and I have had the most amazing advisor in this bubble journey. Thank you, Jos, and thank you, Bubble, for this founder-changing opportunity. Let's start changing the way the human dog world is connected today and have a real impact on their lives for happier, multi-species families. We hope for to hear from you soon. Thank you. Hi there, let me introduce you to Diego. He loves Bella and Max. They are part of his family. After the pandemic, they sleep, eat, and travel together always. Diego discovered Muji when Max, who is always in some type of trouble, got an electric shock with a loose cable. Who finds a loose cable on the beach? Max does. We know everything is perfect till it isn't. Emergencies happen when you least expect them, not only during office hours. Diego found us through Google. He got an overview of our app in the onboarding process. Let us show you a glimpse of the home page. 
to start the self-diagnosis, Diego had to fill Max's profile with relevant information such as his age, breed, and physical condition. Diego can add as many dogs as he likes, and every dog has their own profile. Then, he was able to continue with the diagnosis, answering some questions such as emergency questions to make sure he's not wasting precious time. Max's gum color, which is an important indicator of dog health, and the symptoms themselves. Using our VEC Power database and AI to match the medical terminology in Diego's words, we were able to give him a diagnosis and tell him if it's an emergency and determine the level of risk. The diagnosis includes possible causes and an explanation of what could be happening to Max, as well as things to take into account based on our VEC Developed Symptoms database. After the diagnosis, Diego chose to talk to a VET immediately. The app allows you to pay as you go or do as Diego decided, subscribe to the membership plan. He now has access to online video chats both with and without an appointment, as well as other perks. This is really important because early diagnosis in pets can save pet parents hundreds of dollars and also has an impact on the quality of life of the dog. With his subscription, Diego has been in contact with vets both with and without an appointment. It has been specifically useful when he has had to make some tough medical decisions for a quick second opinion. He now talks vet language and has our coaching so that he can ask the right questions. After the emergency, Diego discovered this is more than a vet app with medical services. There is an activity tracker for tracking his daily interactions with the app. There is a mood tracker for Diego and his pet family. He is able to annotate his feelings as well as his dogs in the wellness diary, which will help him track patterns and receive more specialized suggestions with the mood graphs and his diary. This also is very useful to track your progress when changing behaviors. He also receives badges and has a whole section for them. He has access at the tip of his finger of both Bella's and Max's medical files. He no longer has to worry about remembering things since now he gets reminders when he needs a vaccine or treatment after filling out the registries, which sometimes can be filled out by the vet if the vet has passed Muji's strict screening process. Diego has also explored the wellness activities offered by the app. He first took a test so that Muji could select the best activities for him based on the needs of both humans and dogs. Now he prefers to look for a goal for the week. There are short videos he can watch and usually sets a reminder after a few days. Life with Muji has changed the home dynamic for Diego, Bella, and Max. It would seem everybody is less stressed and happier. They have better communication, a stronger bond, and 24-7 vet care at the tip of his finger. Diego hopes this will mean a longer life together as a family. He just wants the best for them. Sign up for our waiting list at muji.com. This is M O L I dot com. Bye bye now. questions. <laughs> I guess I'll start with one. So uh, you highlighted how large the market is and how many people have pets within their homes. So one may assume that there are many others going after this space. Would you be able to highlight who you think your key competitors are and what your key differentiating factors are? You know, this is an enormous space, but what is happening right now is that people are very specialized. And so a lot of times they say, okay, we're Petco, but we have a vet service, but basically the vet service is just driving traffic into the store. So a lot of the services that you, you might think in the segment are just like oversubscribed are a lot of times just services which add value to the original proposal. And so here we have like three different categories of services that we're starting with our MVP, which is first a triage, which usually when you start thinking of competition, it's like you can even 
think of Google as a competition because when you have like an issue, you probably go online and it's like, oh, my dog is limping. What is he doing? But you can also call friends. You go on Facebook, f Facebook groups. You might call the vet or send him a, a quick chat, but he might not answer. So we're taking care of that space. Then we're also taking care of video consults with a vet, but that means that we are competing with vets who have their practice, mom and pops. But the thing is, when you think of millennials and their complicated life, it's not like they can tell their, their, their boss, like, oh, I'm not coming into work today because I have to take my pet to the vet. And so the idea of being able to do something immediately is really something that is available, but it, it's, it, it's still not so easy to, to have access to. And we're also talking about the training part, which I don't know if you probably have at some point seen a behaviorist or talked to a trainer. And the thing is, training is, there are so many scientific advances today, and they're not being taken into account on, for training. And so the idea is, how can we use science to be able to have a better impact in the lives of pets? And my last thing, which is, I believe is my moat, and that's what I'm building right now, is the idea that I need to be data-driven. And maybe today, AI is to get people into the door and communicate the feelings of how they can express what their dog is feeling and translate it to vet language. But eventually, I want to build my algorithms. I'm going to have like all this rich data that I can use for other sponsors, other products. We're thinking of going into insurance. We're thinking of going into um, just research. So really, I, I can tell you, you probably are like, it's, it's a tough space. But the truth is, it's really an open space if you're thinking with it with another mindset. Thank you. I'm curious to hear a bit more about how you're building out the network of vets that will do the telehealth portion of the app mm -hmm. and how you're positioning the opportunity to them versus brick and mortar practices that they might be engaged with. You know, it, it, it has been a very interesting journey because I went, let me, uh, we, we did like a whole product discovery talking with like users, but we discovered that vets did you know that the highest suicide rate of a profession is like vet, especially women? And did you know that to become a vet, you have to, compare to a doctor, how many, how many like, organisms does a doctor need to know? One, human. The vet has to know reptiles, cats, hamsters, dogs, cows, sheep, and a lot of the organisms are very, very independent. And the thing is, they are overworked. They are underappreciated because like, it's like, this is a doctor. And a vet is a doctor, but it's just like, oh, the vet. And so what we found is that if we are able to give them alternative sources of income so that they can hire more people into their business to work so that they're not like having to answer at a wedding that chat of the, of the owner of the dog that's having like a problem. Um, we are thinking of how we can help them also mom and pop stop stores don't have access to x-rays and all these like more complicated um, equipments which are required to taking care of a pet who has like a, can't talk. What I can say is they all bark, and so this is good for me because if I understand the bark, I can solve it, but they still can't talk. And so the idea is that we're going to be just doing a pilot right now. We're hiring a team of three vets who are going to launch the, the pilot and go from there. We're launching in Mexico City because it's hi a highly populated area. We know the areas in which pets are concentrated, and so we're really trying to get this going in a sense that it will really be able to just roll out in, and grow, but right now it's just going to be concentrated in Mexico City. 
Yeah, it's uh, very cool that you are targeting a specific geography, which helps with kind of the concentration and finding um, players in the marketplace. Uh, I'm curious, as you've you know talked to users, the, the pet owners uh, in that particular geography, are there any unique characteristics about them or unique needs that they have that have inspired uh, how you've built the product? Oh, definitely, because at, at first I was thinking of doing a marketplace, and that would have been like I'm doing everything everybody else is doing. And so as I spoke with them, I realized that their biggest frustration was the idea of, is my dog happy? Is my, am I being able to fulfill the needs of my pet? But at the same time, it was just like, oh, I, I have like this problem, and at, at some point I never took care of it, so I'm just living with it that way. What I realized is that users love their pets. They are willing to sometimes even like stop spending their own money on themselves because they want to treat their pets and they want them to have a good life. But there are still all these things that you can do for them to make it just an easier life and a happier life. And especially if we're talking about longevity, one of the biggest things that impact longevity, dog longevity is stress. And we're thinking of humans, and yes, if you're stressed, that's also something that will impact your, your longevity. And so the idea is how you can turn all these findings into something which is an actionable thing for the user, and today they don't have it. And so the idea is how I can give you a program and tell you, you know, these are stress indicators. This is how to read the body language of your dog. This is how you can tell he's in pain. Pain is also another issue. Like dogs can say, like, I, I'm hurting, but they'll tell you, like, I'm biting you more and I'm probably irritated and something is going on. And so talking to users, what I discovered is they want to know, but they don't know how. And we're giving them that how. Thank you. Fantastic job. All right. So thank you so much, Anna, for being the brave one to go first. Um, so in our first poll, we asked, we're trying to get an idea of just who is everyone here? Like, what's the breakdown of who we have? And so we have about 60% of the audience and online as well, where we have, I think, 11,000 or some odd users tuning in. Um, are actually 60% of those individuals are founders and entrepreneurs, which is really cool. Um, another 20% are like no-code newbies, right, which is also pretty awesome. People who are very new to the space and like many of you are starting the no-code no journey for the first time. Um, and another 20% are actually bubble developers. So please keep answering these polls so we can get to know you a little bit further. Um, now, next up, we're going to have our second finalist of the night, which is Princess. So come on up, Princess. So Princess is building in Bubble to help organizations activate their alumni community. So Princess, yeah. you'll do a fantastic job. Thank sure. you. All right. So in this photo, you'll see my uncle, me, looking super excited, and my dad in the cowboy hat. He was coming straight from Lagos, Nigeria, so I don't know why he had that on, but... Love it for him. And essentially, this was a pivotal moment. This was my graduation a couple of months ago, actually, at Oxford University. And when I look at this photo, I reflect on the joyous time that I had at Oxford, but I also think about the year and a half prior when I arrived to Oxford and absolutely hated it. Essentially, I didn't know anyone, I suffered with imposter syndrome, and I struggled constantly with FOMO. But I soon realized I wasn't alone. Every student and every new alumni, no matter the institution, yearns for a compass and for a sense of belonging. I'm Princess, the founder of Connect You. Our platform connects alumni and students and is that very compass. Now, I want you to recall your first feelings at university, that 
hesitation before entering the lecture hall, the feeling that you'll never find your footing amidst the sea of chaos. We've all been there. But today's students feel that even more intensely. Every day, they're bombarded with new information, opportunities, and choices. The weight of choices like which courses to take, which clubs to join, and even where to study can feel like a constant state of stress. And even worse, they are more lonely than ever before and looking for guidance and connection. In fact, one in four students say they are lonely most or all of the time. That is four times worse than the one in 20 adults who say the same. Now, what about our, you know, the people that went through this path before, our alumni? They reflect on their triumphs, their challenges, and they want to pay it forward and mentor the next generation. They also want to remain tethered to their institution and connected to the peers that went on that pivotal journey with them all those years ago. Yet, only 22% of alumni surveyed felt their alma mater understood their needs and preferences. Now, what about our administrators? They work tirelessly, striving to create an environment where every individual can thrive. And they have a very unique vantage point. They see the anxiety of the new students, the pride of the alumni, and the potential of every single person that enters onto that campus. But what they need is a tool that connects all of these different individuals and bridges these experiences. Yet 62% of alumni management staff believe their current engagement tools just don't cut it. Enter Connect You. For the current students bombarded with new choices, Connect You is that friend that points them to the best spots on campus or the senior that helps them navigate tricky uh, course selections. With our aspirations dashboard, ConnectU connects them to the events, the resources, and the people that can help them reach their greatest aspirations. For our alumni, ConnectU provides a, well, it provides a great alumni directory that connects them to the people that they want to remain those bonds continue those bonds with. And for our administrators, with our AI-powered insights, ConnectU provides the data that helps them have actionable strategies and insights. Now, there are over 20,000 universities worldwide with a $4.3 billion market size. But the opportunities are well beyond education. There are 98% of Forbes 500 companies have an alumni engagement program. And when they do this correctly, they see two and a half times more revenue per employee and four and a half times more engagement and uh, innovation. Also, NGOs are also seeing alumni engagement as an opportunity to build their volunteer base and also their fundraising efforts. So it's very clear that ConnectU has a vast and varied future beyond just education. Now, let's talk about traction. We started off with testing 90 users across 150 organizations, across sectors, and now we've signed two customers. We've used those insights from the customer conversations to iterate rapidly and to learn. And so with these two customers, now we have access to 2,000 users, and we've already seen in our MVP an 84% repeat user rate. We're going to essentially use those two users, to, or those two customers, to inform our insights and to iterate rapidly. Our business model is a SaaS revenue B2B model split across three tiers based on the number of users, and our pricing is about mid-tier, ensuring that we're competitive. So our future is very bright, and we are excited to build our momentum and set our sights high, but we can't do this alone. We're actively seeking a co-founder, proficient in bubble and software engineering, and importantly, someone who shares our passion for genuine connection. So if our path aligns with yours, let's join forces and propel connect you to unparalleled heights. Thank you.
Meet Prin, a recent graduate of Oxford University who's just received an intriguing invite from her college. An invitation to connect you. The white label AI powered platform tailored for current students and alumni. Eagerly, Prin initiates her Connect You journey. She enters her basic details, proudly confirming her alumni status and her graduation year. The platform then invites her to detail her experiences spanning the city she's lived in, worked, and studied, as well as her industry experience and career journey. Next, Prina is asked to share her aspirations and objectives. Dreaming of a future in Africa and a pivot to climate consulting, Prin feels in her aspirations. Her interest extends beyond work. She's eager to learn local languages, hoping to gain a competitive edge in her new career path. Prin then indicates her interest in receiving a mentor. Now here's where Connect You truly shines. Instantly, it understands Prin's aspirations and already begins to present potential mentors that align with her goals, even before finishing sign-up. Nonplay, a management consultant from South Africa, catches Prin's eye, and a quick dive into Nonplay's impressive profile solidifies Prin's choice. As Prin wraps up her registration, she uploads her profile picture, uses her university email for verification, selects the password, and effortlessly links her LinkedIn for easy updates. Her calendar is also synced, streamlining appointment scheduling and ensuring optimal meeting times with her new connection. Upon logging in, Prin's attention is immediately captured by a pop-up. It's an active fundraising campaign from her college at Oxford University, Hartford College, but this isn't any random campaign. Using the data Prin provided and her studies at Oxford University, Connect You, with its smart personalization, deduce that Prin would likely be interested in the Hartford Sustainability Fund. Why? Well, research has shown individuals are more likely to donate to causes they care about, and Connect You knew of Prin's strong inclination towards climate consulting. Captivated by the tailored approach, Prin is moved to donate. She could, however, choose to click Hide Announcement. Delving further into Connect You's features, Print encounters the Aspirations dashboard. This integrated feature is designed to allow both alumni and current students to track and measure their progress against their professional and personal goals. Interactive, user-friendly, and data-driven, the Aspirations dashboard offers a clear visual representation of her progress and achievement. Beyond the donation, the Making the Pivot career event is hard to miss. Connect You's hyper-personalized touch ensures events near Prank's location are highlighted. As she scrolls, a treasure trove of resources emerges, each tailored to her aspirations and career stage. Hyper-personalized events, blogs, webinars, and other resources pop up, each aligned to Prince interests. Now, the game changer, daily personalized connections. Connect You intelligently matches Prince with potential mentors and peers that will best help her reach her highest aspirations and goals. Every day, Connect You suggests three top potential connections. Today, Megan stands out, an alumna who once inspired Prin with her talks. An efficient system, Connect You proposes an optimal meeting time, eliminating the age-old back-and-forth scheduling. Diving deeper, the alumni directory invites her curiosity. Here, she can rekindle connections with past friends or forge new bonds. Connect You isn't just about profiles. Its messaging portal makes connecting real and personal. Messages light up her notification pane. Megan's prompt response to the mentorship chat, invite, and a fresh message from News Await. September 26 arrives, and Prince is ready for her mentorship chat with Megan. The Connect You platform facilitates a seamless interaction. Upon concluding, Prince prompted to leave feedback enhancing the platform's future mentor suggestions and providing admins of mentorship programs at Oxford with valuable insights. From the student view to the admin's eyes, from valuable insights to mentor pairing to alumni database updates, they're all automated. With these insights, fundraising efforts are now laser focused, resonating deeply with alumni passion. From students to admins, let connect you Connect you. Visit the connectyou.com. Awesome job.
Thank you. Um, yeah, very cool product. And it's also amazing to hear that um, you've sold it to two customers. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, with those two customers, uh, what did you learn about the sort of sales life cycle about selling to colleges and universities? Yeah, so um, yeah, one of them is a the department in the university. And I've learned that, um, I'm trying to see what I can say. <laughs> Essentially, um, a lot of the technical issues, like the GDPR issues in the UK in particular, can be the huge bottleneck when it comes to securing a customer. And so understanding kind of the data privacy features, how we're going to protect students' information beyond just the norm of like a regular social network was something that I had to really learn. And over, I guess, um, like protect students, essentially. Like, be very conscientious of that. So I think that was the main thing. Also, the life cycle of the sales. Um, it can be extremely long. So I'm still in talks with a few other departments. And it's taking forever because of um, just like either funding issues when they receive their fundings or just like having to justify it to the higher ups in the departments, essentially, and show that there's a value. Because a lot of these old institutions are kind of startup averse. Like they don't want to necessarily be a, a guinea pig, essentially. So you have to show them that innovation is a good thing and that, you know, we need to move towards the future. So, yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. I love the photo at the front with your dad. The personal story <laughs> is always great. Um, would love to hear your thoughts about where ConnectU sits relative to other social and professional networking platforms, like social media or LinkedIn, and how you'll keep both alumni and students on the platform versus moving on to other places that they've spent more natural time once these initial connections have been created. Yeah, so I will pull up my appendix. <laughs> Do I just get the... Oh, okay, great. All right, so essentially, um, I did consider social media as part of the um, indirect competitors. Um, essentially, the difference between connects you and LinkedIn and Facebook, for example. So just taking a step back, a lot of the customer conversations I had or pers prospective customer conversations with universities was that they hated the existing solutions because it's very unengaging, it's very non-dynamic, and they tend to be kind of Facebook clones, essentially. So look, the look and feel of Facebook, but less engaging. Um, and they are now relying on things like, yeah, LinkedIn pages and Facebook groups, but they don't have the data like, they don't have the analytics. So a lot of our conversations would go like, oh, yeah, we now use um, Facebook or LinkedIn because it's just more convenient. And then it's like, oh, so how is the engagement? Oh, well, we assume it's great. Like, I mean, they don't really like our posts. They don't really speak in the group pages. But they're making this assumption that maybe they're getting, you know, people are DMing each other and, like, having those peer-to-peer -peer conversations, but they have no proof of this. And so something that really stood out to a lot of the um, universities I spoke to and NGOs and even law firms I spoke to was this idea that they would actually have an in-depth look of those interactions and be able to say, look, our mentorship program is working or you know, our community engagement is increasing significantly with this new web webinar that we did. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's the major thing. And then as far as, I think your second part was the differentiator with, um, Sorry, I missed the second piece of your question. I'm just curious how you'll keep people engaged on ConnectU versus yeah. going off platform once you've made these matches that are valuable to them. Yeah, so I think the huge thing is how do we add value to the users and how do we make it as convenient as possible? So, for example, from the alumni perspective, a lot of us, I'm a new alumni, and I'm getting tapped often by current students, like, hey, can we have a... 30-minute coffee chat or whatever, but the back and forth with scheduling is so difficult that I oftentimes, like, it just takes forever. Um, I also, when I was a current student, was a part of a two or three mentorship programs, actually, for different clubs I was a part of. And I ended up not meeting with any of my mentors because we just couldn't schedule our calendars. And so having something like Connect You, where you go in, it suggests the time that works for you both, you don't have to go back and forth anymore. And it makes also everything convenient from like, okay, here are the resources, here are the events, and here are the people that you should talk to and that you should connect with in order to advance your aspirations. It makes it a lot more clear for them and more of a value add. Thank you. 
Um, I had a quick question about one of your slides. Um, it seems that you highlighted that um, when students and uh, workers are appropriately supported, they can reflect or represent billions of dollars of positive impact, I guess, within their specific areas. How is Connect U kind of tracking that to show the value to the constituents you're selling into? Yeah, so how do we show, essentially your question is how do we show value to the institution? And track, I think, the, the economic value or impact. All the economic. You highlighted in that slide. Yeah, so one of the prospective customers I'm talking to, they're trying to increase their fundraising amongst alumni. And so something that we will be able to track is, okay, so here is bespoke fundraising campaign. So like in the video, it showed that um, the fundraising effort that was shown to that individual was one that they would actually be interested in. So there's that. And then the clicks, the click-through rate for that would be measured as well as kind of connecting each individual's uh, donations from that click-through. So, um, for example, one of the possible departments I would be working with, they wanted to embed Connect You onto their platform or somehow, like, link it to their platform. So, essentially, I can use their analytics to show, okay, this is how many people donated, this is the click-through rate, and this is the link between that person clicking through and the donations increasing. I don't know if I explained that clearly, but, yeah, hopefully. Yes, certainly. Thank okay. you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Princess. That was fantastic. Um, so I quickly want to read out on our second poll. So we asked who or what excites you most about no-code technology, and we had about 60%, 60 to 70% of you said it's the speed of development and prototyping, which I think it's obvious. All of us agree that we love the speed that we're able to achieve with Bubble, so that's fantastic. Um, but about 24% of you said that the other thing that really excites you is just the, the democratization of, uh, of tech, right? So I think all of us are really excited about the fact that we can get more people who have been underrepresented or more people who haven't historically been part of the, or have had the ability to be able to build tech, they now will be able to. So I think all of us are very much on the same page about that. With that being said, we are going to bring in our third finalist of the night, which is Vaish. And um, what's really interesting about Vaish is that she's building in Bubble to help kids nurture a love of storytelling and reading. And so she's going to come on board and tell us about what she's built. Everyone give her a round of applause. Thank you. All right, you got this. Wow, it's so great to be here. BubbleCon folks, how are we doing today? <laughs> Woo! Quick show of hands, how many of you have read anything in the past hour? News, Twitter, email? OK, OK, all of you. I see you're at least reading my slides, so that's a good news. Um, we don't think much about reading, because it's in our nature. It's become second nature to most of us, and we don't even take a second about it. That was a pun intended. Um, neither did I. I grew up loving to read, and I always enjoy reading even today. But that changed for me this March when I started appreciating reading anymore. I was sitting on my couch and reading on my laptop, and my four-year-old nephew was playing next to me with his toy truck. He walked over at some point, peeped into my screen, shrugged, and walked away. That little incident triggered something in me. I felt really guilty. So I quickly pulled out a couple of his books and started reading out to him. He did not budge. His toy truck was way more interesting than whatever I was reading to him. But something magical happened in a few moments. He started narrating a story about a carrot-shaped truck. I never imagined it. I got really excited. Being the AI nerd that I am these days, I quickly pulled up ChatGPT and Dolly and created a story. And what was wonderful was we spent the next one hour completely engrossed in that story. We really enjoyed reading together. And that's when I realized there's something magical about this experience. I asked myself, would other kids benefit from this? I reached out to about 40 other families to find out what they were up to. And every single one of them, not skipping one, said the exact same thing to me, which is, can you teach my kid to read? I was kind of surprised by the resonance of this feedback. Why was this the unanimous piece of feedback that I was getting? I reached out to teachers, educators, VCs, founders in the edtech ecosystem, and they all pointed me out, pointed out to me that we have a reading epidemic on our hands. I know that's a scary word these days. But it's interesting because less than half of the kids aged two to five are read to on a weekly basis. 
which means they build no intuition for reading, no appetite for storytelling. This compounds further into one in three kids being able to read at or above grade level at, you know, when they're in fourth grade, which means we lose about 67% of our learners already. Isn't that crazy? And this compounds in one in six high schoolers, which is 1.2 million teens dropping out of high school due to illiteracy-related reasons. These stats are really, really crazy. These kids are also growing in a very dynamic world, very different from the one I grew up in. A kid aged between two to eight years spends about two and a half to three hours a day on devices. Two and a half to three hours. But 73% of that is just watching videos. 16% on gaming and a mere 3% on reading. That stopped me. I paused to ask myself, what can we do to flip this ratio? What can we do to change these thoughts from becoming passive consumers to active creators? And that's the vision behind Simile. We want to use the power of games and adventures to help kids learn to read. Because we believe that reading should be like gaming, exciting and fun. Because why not, right? We want reading to feel adventurous, powered by their own curiosities and explorations. We want reading to feel tailored to their imagination, their interests, and their pace of learning. We have something for the adults too, don't worry. We'll make this a completely child-led experience powered by audio and an intuitive user experience. We'll also make this a privacy-first product. We'll let parents know what data we're collecting and how we're using it in a very transparent manner so that you don't have to worry about it. And we will also make this a completely multimodal AI experience that delivers enriching and engaging text, audio, and visuals. All of this is in the service of a much broader mission and simile. We want to turn Simile into a true tutor. I had to practice saying that a few times. A true tutor that uses games and personalization from machine learning to deliver an enriching educational experience for your child. We'll eventually even get to other languages and other subject matters, but that's a story for another day. If we deliver on this promise and deliver on the learning outcomes, we will be making a big impact on society. This is the future generation we're talking about. But not just that. This is also a massive market opportunity. If we just go after the children's book market, that's a $10 billion opportunity, $10 billion opportunity in and of itself. But we want to set our sights a little further. We want to go after the educational gaming market. I didn't even realize this was a market, but it's compounding at 38% per annum to be a $50 billion opportunity by the time we hit 2030. And most importantly, we're passionate about serving 650 million cute young learners worldwide. And we'll make this really simple and accessible using a subscription-based pricing model coupled with a direct-to-consumer acquisition model. We'll start with parents who care the most about this problem and scale through partnerships with schools, reading-related nonprofits, and other stakeholders in the educational ecosystem. Join us, won't you, in our learning revolution. Please sign up today at www.simile.app and join our early access program. Give us feedback and tell us how Simile can help your kid learn better. Now on to our product demo, where we feature Carla and her four-year-old son, Juan, who are part of our early access program. I would love for you to pay attention to the detail that we've taken to inform by the science of reading and early childhood development. I'll step out. Carla loved to read books when she was growing up. She has a four-year-old son, Juan, who is not taken to books and reading as much as she had hoped for him to. She gets really concerned, but comes across Simile in her search for solutions. Simile makes reading feel like games and play, and she knows that Juan would really appreciate this approach. She decides to sign him up. She starts by entering in her email address and password and clicks on sign up. She's then thanked for signing up and told to take a minute to set up her child's experience. She starts by entering in some of the basic information required by the application. She decides to skip adding an image for now. She knows she can always come back to it later. She's then asked to pick at least four character categories that Juan would really enjoy. She reviews the grid and picks four that she knows Juan would really appreciate. 
she already gets the value prop of simile she clicks finish setup she's then told that she's completed the onboarding process and that for the next step she needs to have her audio on and have phone nearby she's in the middle of something so she decides to come back to it later later that evening carla sits down with juan after dinner time since this is their first time using this application she decides to start by clicking on start a new story hi there welcome to simile let's pick a robot friend to help you click on a robot to hear how it talks when you like one click the green button under it to choose let's play juan is delighted He really likes the voice of the bot and appreciates all the color on the screen. He wants to try a couple of voices. Hi there. I would love to be your simile bot. That's too slow. Hi there. I would love to be your simile bot. He really likes that voice and his favorite color is orange. He picks that. Hello jungle explorer. Ready to uncover hidden treasures in our story jungle? Swipe to find a character you like. Tap on it and click on the green button. Juan loves swiping, so he checks out all the characters and decides to pick on Terry the train. Now find a setting you like. Tap on it and click on the green button. You're almost there. Juan really likes how this image looks, so he picks that for his first story. I'm writing your special story. As you wait, can you pop the balloons which have the sound shown in the box? In this game, as he waits for his story to load. Juan reviews the sound that is presented in this box above and then matches where the balloon show that sound in the words that they display. He has fun clicking through this especially because he loves bursting balloons. Once the story is loaded, Juan sees the screen and knows to click on the green button. Here's your special story. Tap the arrows to turn pages. Hit the heart to save. Use mute for quiet reading and the speaker to hear the story. Terry's terrific train adventure. He starts the story. The bot instructed him to use the speaker button to be read to. Once upon a time, in a quaint Victorian train station, lived Terry, the train. He was fast, fearless. and everyone's favorite his engine roared like a content lion juan is already engaged in the story he flips through the rest of the pages and reads all the pages and then he clicks on the heart button because he really likes the story juan logs in back the next day and wants to go back and read some of his favorite stories he navigates to the favorites tab Welcome to your favorite stories. Click on any of them and read that story again. He's super excited to revisit the story about Kathy the cat. So he clicks on that. And then he can reread the entire story the same way he used to. Carla also wants to take a look at Juan's engagement on the app. So she navigates to the parents tab and is greeted with a dashboard that tells her the number of stories Juan has read, the number of stories he's favorited. the number of characters he's explored and the number of phonics he's been exposed to and there's a detailed table showing all of the work that he's been doing so far on the application she is pleased this is the most juan has read since she's bought any books for him simile has the power to personalize and grow increasingly complex as we teach the kids how to read using this application we will be adding more interactions more comprehension related stuff and more gamification and badges along the way. We're super excited about our roadmap and the power of AI to radically revolutionize kids instruction. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. I think one area where it would be great to hear a bit more is just understanding the technology stack behind the content that you're generating on the platform would love to hear how that's being generated and how you think about how that might evolve as the product becomes more mature sure so there are two parts to the application one is completely built on bubble uh, everything is on bubble by the way but like one part of it is completely built with api plugins so 
I've used um, primarily OpenAI to start with for mm -hmm. the text generation. GPT-4 is the best on the market, state mm -hmm. of the art. Um, but higher temperatures just to ensure that you know, kids get creative um, you know, outputs every time. Mm -hmm. And then for um, the art aspect of it, we're going currently with Stable Diffusion's Excel model. Um, and then finally for the audio, we're using Levin Labs at this stage, but constantly experimenting and learning around open source and everything to see what works best. Um, for the game itself, uh, I've actually used a bit of code in the product, so it's HTML, CSS, JavaScript, pretty basic stuff at this stage, mm -hmm. but I have access to gaming engineers and mm -hmm. designers, so hopefully this will get a little bit more immersive and complex over time. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Well, I was just gonna say, I love your presentation. As a kid, I hated reading, so <laughs> this presentation really resonated with me. Uh, one thing that did stick out, however, was in your pitch, you referenced using ChatGPT and Dolly in your MVP. And so long-term, I wanted to know, what do you think is gonna be your kind of proprietary edge that will stop others from kind of copying a model that you might prove out? Yeah, that's a great question. I think primarily when you start out on, in this space, there's very little moat, but over a period of time, we'll get, gather data about what's working and what's not. And the other big differentiator why we, actually this entire experience is child-led. One of the biggest things we learned when we were talking to parents is that a lot of ChatGPT and other products out there actually re require like adult supervision right now. And there's a big trend in education based on research that suggests as much independence as you give to kids to like explore their own curiosity without interventions from adults, they actually learn better and their motivation levels are higher. So the big differentiator is right now in the us user experience where it's completely child-led, there's no adult needed, maybe the first time they might need an adult to just show them around, but they get used to it and it's pretty simple. And over a period of time, with the data and the gamification and the badges, all of that will keep the users on the platform and retain them. And all the science behind in terms of the phonics, the decodables, the reading instruction, we have some advisors on board who are starting to help us from behind the scenes. So that's the way we're creating a motor around this product at this stage. Cool. I think it's a very cool product. Um, if my son is any indication, I recommend a character that's a construction vehicle. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, especially an excavator. My, mine was a carrot-shaped truck, but yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Max the construction vehicle is totally possible. Yeah. Um, so you just mentioned uh, research, and I was actually curious about um, how you're trying to incorporate uh, research findings, especially around how kids most effectively learn reading into the product and especially into like what the, you know, the AI models generate for you? Sure, so the most common question, I ended up consulting for a net tech recently as well just to get a little bit more immersed in this space and the biggest question we get from parents is like how do you tie it back to some kind of curriculum and standards, right? So the first thing I'm starting to do is like tie all these phonics and decodables to like age appropriate, um, you know, so there's a big database of like at this age you should be able to read these kinds of phonics and decodables, so that's the starting point but I'm constantly keeping up with educational research through partnerships with people that I know in the space who are trying to sort of tell me what's going on behind the scenes. And then I'm also gonna bring on board um, a behavioral scientist who just tells me a little bit about children, early childhood education specifically because there's a lot of psychology involved in like, right from the font that we picked actually. Andika is a very specific font that we picked informed by the fact that each letter is pretty distinct and easy to read to the voices where each voice actually appeals to a different segment of kids. Like some of them really like the high energy voice, especially if they're slightly ADHD. Um, if, they're, if they're on the spectrum, um, they prefer a different voice. If they are prone to anxiety, they like, like the first voice, which is a little calmer. So we've done a lot of research around that through user testing and by talking to behavioral scientists. So we'll continue to build on that further along as well. So very active in that field and trying to stay up with all the trends, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vaish. We appreciate it, that was a fantastic pitch. And so we're going to move on into our last pitch of the evening, just to make sure that we're on uh, par with time. So Deb, Deb is building in Bubble in order to make data management during disasters for pet shelters easier and better. And so Deb, we're gonna go ahead and bring you on stage um, so you can do your last pitch. Thank you so much. Okay. So I would like everybody to clap if you have experienced a disaster or any kind of extreme weather in the last five years. Now I'd like for you to clap if you have prepared your disaster plan and you know what to do in a disaster. 
Okay, so this is what happens when you don't have a plan. This is a picture from Katrina, and I don't know if any of you remember Katrina, but here in the U.S., it was a really dreadful, dreadful hurricane, and it was so powerful. When I saw this image, I thought, this is not good, really not good. So in 2018, I kept thinking about this image, and being a big, huge animal lover, I couldn't not think about this. So I joined the Central Vermont Disaster Animal Response Team. <clears throat> And I was absolutely stunned in 2018, 10 pieces of paper, lots of the same data on every single page, was required for every single pet that you filled out when they're in an emergency shelter. And I thought, wow, this is not good. So I decided to take my 30 years of experience building websites and mobile apps to start developing a tool that volunteers could use. Now you may ask, why doesn't this exist already? Well, volunteers don't have a voice or financial support at the national level. So one of the things to keep in mind is that there are sort of three stages. There's before, during, and after. Before a disaster is really critical because this is when you figure out where are you gonna shelter, what's the building, who's gonna help provide the supplies, do you actually have trained volunteers? Because if you have a pet, you want to make sure that whoever's with your pet knows what they're doing. Then, of course, there's during the disaster. And during a disaster, it's really important to document all of the information that you're managing the care of the pet. The after time is used to debrief and think about what worked and what didn't work. And this is how we grow and make better plans going forward. Well, I lived in Texas and North Carolina, and you expect hurricanes there, right? Okay, then when I moved to Vermont, I was astonished. Hurricane Irene landed in Vermont, and I thought, good Lord, what do we come to when hurricanes are hitting Vermont? Not good. But our little state learned some really important lessons because this summer, that's our capital. We had rain. It started in June, and when I left yesterday, it was still raining. Um, it's been a big problem having all of this rain, but this was disastrous in Vermont. But the good news was we had learned some great lessons from Irene, and we had the CV Dart team who was ready to help shelter pets at the Berry Auditorium. It was at this point that it was a little extreme because it was relentless. The rain kept coming, and it wouldn't stop. It was unbelievable. My garden was devastated. I didn't have to water after May. It was really amazing. But this shelter provided 24-7 care to 72 pets for 26 days. Now, CV Dart was well-trained, but even 26 days, that's a lot of time. So they brought in volunteers from other parts of the state as well as around the country, actually. So after the disaster, we talked with them because they were using our beta version. We had created a beta version of our app, and they were using it to track the care of pets during the shelter. And they just told us that it was really awesome because they used their phones and their iPads to track all of the data. So we knew how many pets were there. That's how we got that data. And that's how we knew that there were 1,700 hours of volunteer time. Now, Vermont is not alone because the whole world is experiencing disasters. Our tiny little state experienced, and this is just of the moment, $120 million, and they're still counting. The U.S. has experienced $45 billion worth of disasters. There have been $23 billion disasters just this year. And, of course, the global situation. So what we know is... This is not changing, it's getting worse. Mother Nature's super angry with us and we need to do something about it. Well, what I've done is I've taken my experience and I'm building this app to help volunteers have a operational platform so that it starts from before with the planning and it goes all the way through the disaster management. We know that our audience is generally retired volunteers. They 
um, are not necessarily technically savvy, so it's got to be a super easy user interface, and that's been one of our primary objectives. Now, we've done this through a volunteer group, um, and we've come to the realization that if we're going to go larger than just Vermont, we really need to raise some money. So that's a big goal at this point. We've established our MVP, and part of the way we've done this is by joining this spring, we decided to test Bubble, because I had written this um, software, the first version, the beta version, in PHP and Laravel. I am not a programmer, and I can't fix typos. We had several, and it's very expensive to do that. So we started exploring Bubble this spring, and then I got a letter, an email actually, saying, join the Immerse program, and trying to about to share you, with you what I've learned. So. Okay. We've got a lot more going on. What I'm only going to show you is our MVP, which is the emergency pet shelter module. But we have so much more that we want to do because it's a really intense project and takes a lot of data. So um, I'm going to show you the MVP. And we've got volunteer organizations across the country who've already contacted us. And the, the dots that you see are people who have expressed interest. They would like for us to show them a demo. They're ready to keep moving forward. So the first year we were in business, I started the nonprofit in 2022. We raised just under $13,000. That's not much money. That all went to that PHP program, just letting you know that. Um, this year, we've got a grant, and, and all of this has been done through grants and donations, small dollar donations, let me point that out. But they make a difference. And so this year, we're, we've gotten a grant, and we're hoping to raise more funds this year through donations, grants, as well as getting some corporate sponsorships. These are a few of the organizations that I've worked with over the last several years who actually don't have a whole platform, an operational platform to work from. We also see them as potential customers. Now, what you're going to see in the demo is uh, Kate is the shelter manager, and this is based on a true story. I've changed the name of the cat to protect its innocence. <laughs> and I do need to give you a spoiler alert, because I don't tell you in the demo, the cat's OK. So. I'd like to do an extended thank you to my team members and all of the folks who supported me through this process. And I also want to give a special shout out to all the bubble folks, particularly Kelly and James, who helped me through this process. Yes. And with that, I'm going to leave you to the demo. But I want you to be sure and put a plan together, because you need one. And so do your pets. Kate is the shelter manager and has returned for her shift at the shelter. She logs into Dart CC on her iPad. Then she selects the active deployment. All pets who are staying at the shelter show on this roster page, giving the volunteers a central location to see who is in the shelter. As the shelter manager, it is Kate's responsibility to review the roster and make sure she is aware of who is still active in the shelter. These pets were here during her last shift so she is familiar with them. The shelter manager is responsible for overseeing all the activity in the shelter. So her next task is to review the summary of what care has been provided today. She clicks on the daily care summary to see what has been completed. She notices that Mischief has a note to check the medical records as he has not been urinating. Yesterday, one of the volunteers told her they were concerned that he has not been urinating, so she checks the medical care summary to see if there are any updates. Kate is relieved to see that the vet is checking mischief, so she heads over to the medical care area of the shelter. As she is walking, she clicks on mischief's profile to familiarize herself with the details of mischief. She double checks the daily care tab to see the details and scrolls down to review the documentation from her team. Her team has been noting their concerns. Details like this are important, and Dart CC makes tracking this information easy. 
Kate arrives at the medical area of the shelter and clicks on the medical tab. The veterinarian lets Kate know that Mischief is in need to be released so they can take him to the medical facility. Kate selects the record feature to quickly document what is happening with Mischief. Mischief will be transported to the clinic to complete care and the owner will pick up Mischief once he has recovered. Mischief may return to the shelter if they have not found other housing. While this is completing the process, the vet says Mischief was very fortunate that the volunteers were paying attention to these details. This could have been deadly for him had they not been documenting these observations. Kate clicks to complete the transcription process, double checks the notes, and makes an additional comment on the information. Mischief is now ready for transport. Kate clicks on the final release tab to complete the release process. She asks the vet to sign for the release of Mischief. She saves his signature and then saves the changes. This generates a PDF that is emailed to the owner and can be printed out for the veterinarian. Now both the owner and the vet have a complete history of the care Mischief received while he was at the emergency shelter. Kate returns to the front of the shelter as two new families have arrived and are in need of registration. Kate will help complete the intake process for these new arrivals. Emergency pet shelters have a great deal of information that should be documented so the volunteers and owners are aware of what care the pets have received at the shelter. DART Command Central gives volunteers an easy way to document and access all of the information on any mobile device so they can focus on the care of pets and not paperwork. If you would like more information, please visit dartcc.org. Here I am. I'll, I'll kick it off. Okay. Um, so in your presentation, you highlighted that your goal, I believe, in the next 12 to uh, 24 months will be to raise uh, $500,000. How might that support um, this endeavor? How would you use those funds? Well, all the work has been volunteer up to this point, so we're hoping to pay people. That would be the big part of it. Um, and we've got a couple of different areas that we really want to focus on because we've got seven modules. And so the next thing that's the most complicated part is scheduling, and we'd like to do that next because what we understand is that if we can master scheduling, that would really address a lot of our organizational partners. Thank you. Sure. I'd love to hear more about what the existing solution set looks like. What are shelters currently using to tackle these challenges? and? to the extent that there is a competitive landscape with other you know, technology vendors, we'd love to hear your perspective on it. Sure. Well, the biggest competitor that we have is paper. <laughs> and um, you think I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, there, I, I spent three years searching to try and find a solution. Everything that I found was really focused on shelters who are trying to adopt pets. And that's a completely different world, and the requirements are completely different. So that's why I decided to go ahead and do this, because I'm insane. <laughs> yeah, to, to extend on that question a little bit, you know, it, this is a great cause and seems like a great tool for, for this need. It does also feel like the feature set might actually have some kind of similarity with a feature set you might need for general disaster uh, response. So I'm curious if you've looked into um, the market for software or platforms for generalized uh, disaster response teams, or if that's even an area you've thought about expanding into, perhaps. Oh, absolutely. Um, I can tell you that in my communications with the Red Cross, they use Salesforce. Awesome tool. Really focused on disasters. Um, <laughs> You think I'm kidding. <laughs> um, the other thing that I've looked into is um, trying to address 
The solution that we're coming up with has a lot of opportunity. One of the things that we've noticed in talking with a lot of organizations who do disasters, there is the uh, disaster recovery, um, there's dealing with fires, those are a very different beast. Um, in California, they've got a whole different challenge where sometimes people shelter in place and so they need to be a way of documenting that. Um, there is a tool that we are looking to partner with um, because they too are a bunch of volunteers who put something together. So basically, it's a bunch of volunteers who continue volunteering and what I'm trying to do is to help consolidate that into a single platform to make it so that anyone can use it um, regardless of their skill sets. I don't think I answered your question. <laughs> kind of did. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? I got a whole minute. <laughs> nope. Okay. We're good? I think we're one, right. one apiece. Thank we're you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to go for one. I wasn't, I wasn't sure if you All right, fantastic, fantastic job to all of the finalists tonight. Thank you so much. So it's this part of the evening where I'm going to take the judges back with me. We're going to deliberate, and you all will be in for a treat in terms of what happens next. And we're going to have our PM associate for Immerse, Zane Silva, come and talk a little bit about what's happening next. And judges, you guys will follow me. No need to clap. <laughs> okay, y'all, how's everyone feeling right now? Let's give it up one more time for our finalists, uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with very closely for the last eight to ten weeks. Um, that was that was great. Uh, okay, so we have something exciting coming up. We have an interview. Uh, it's going to be phenomenal. But before we do that, I want everyone to take out your phone really quickly. Please take out your phone. Take out your phone. Uh, this is the portion where you're going to be voting for our community favorite out of our finalists. So you're going to open the Hopin app. You're going to go to the top right corner, hit that message icon, and you're going to see all the other polls that you didn't answer that you have a moment to answer right now. But make sure that you answer our community favorite. This is the portion where you get to behave as a judge for us. And so we're super excited to see who y'all select. Um, well, while y'all do that, I would love to bring to stage uh, J.V. Nava, the, the director of Community at Bubble, and Obi Chukuma, founder of Mara. JV leads Bubble's community team, fostering authentic connections and driving meaningful relationships within the Bubble community. Previously, as the VP of Community at Peloton, she played an instrumental role in overseeing member engagement during the company's transition from startup to publicly traded entity. She's excited to host Hashtag BubbleCon 2023, her first of many community initiatives to come. And then we have Obi Chikuma, founder of Mara, Obi is the founder of Mara, a personal hair concierge that simplifies textured hair care through behavioral and cosmetic science. Prior to Mara, Obi worked in equity crowdfunding at Seed Invest, where she helped founders raise over $75 million by activating their communities and investors. A civil engineer by training, she's a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University and the Parsons School for Design. I'd love to welcome them on stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zane, and thank you, Obi, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Awesome, and while you're all answering the polls, we hope that you're listening in, in to a very fruitful conversation that we're about to have with Obi. Um, first of all, congratulations on winning fan favorite from yep. the last cohort, which was, I believe, in February. Yes. Um, for those tuning in with us online and here in person, can you refresh and share with us what Mara um, is solving. Absolutely. So Mara aims to simplify textured hair care using both behavioral and cosmetic science. And we really want to educate and empower our users to be able to take full control over their hair. Um, and the reason that we're doing this is because one of the main issues in the hair care industry, especially the textured hair care industry, is misinformation. It's rampant. And we found that very early on when we were testing that if we just gave people more information, even if we said it was science-backed, we're kind of just adding to the overwhelm because essentially they get this and they're like, why should I believe you over this other article that also says it's science-backed? And how on earth can I apply this to my actual hair and what I actually need 
And also, this doesn't fit in with my lifestyle, so is it even helpful? Um, and so that's when we realized that in order to actually help users, we need to provide that information, but we also need to turn it into a way that they can establish healthy hair care practices and do the heavy lifting for them. And so, you know, what does that look like? That looks like analyzing trends in your breakage and actually being able to get ahead of it, give you helpful tips and tricks for how to mitigate it. Also looks like improving your shopping experience in store. So for example, if you're scanning a product, you just wanna know if it works for you, now we can do that for you and provide you a nice score that lets you know the likelihood it's actually gonna work for your hair profile. Um, and that really just lets users focus on their hair and let us focus on all the other stuff. That's awesome, that's great. I feel like I definitely need to keep track of that. Um, and personally, we need to use that. <laughs> and can you tell us what happened with product development in particular since February? Absolutely, so after Immerse, we actually attempted to do a beta. Um, it did not work for a lot of reasons. Um, essentially, the web app that we had built um, Actually, I should add this context. We're building a native app. And so everything that I had built during the Immerse program was really just a glorified mobile responsive web page. Um, but a lot of the functionality that we had built really isn't meant for that. It really needs to be tested and tried in your hands when you're mobile, you're on the go. So very quickly we realized we needed to kind of change gears um, and actually start preparing for the full app wrapping process. And so that's what we started doing. Um, for those who haven't done that before, that means you need to turn all of your web pages into one page. Um, and so a lot of it was rebuilding that. I also just got a lot better at Bubble. Um, and I realized I built a lot of pages really poorly initially. So I did a lot of rebuilding. Um, and I'm happy to say that as of like two weeks ago, we're actually fully in beta on uh, iOS and in Google Play. So we're getting ready to do a full launch. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, congratulations. Thank you. That's amazing. I think we have a lot of founders and entrepreneurs in the audience today. So I want to ask, not only has it been eight months um, since the cohort and since your demo day, mm -hmm. um, but you also went full time in yes. being a solo yeah. entrepreneur. I think we all want to know what has been the most challenging part yeah. about being a solo entrepreneur? Yeah, I think honestly, it's a mix of time management and then also kind of understanding who I am as an entrepreneur. I think there's a lot of pressure to act and be a certain way. Um, and for some reason, it's, you know, if you're working on something that you love and that's your passion, that you should be able to grind on it 24 seven and you kind of feel this like external pressure to do that. I learned very quickly that does not work for me. And just as you're at a nine to five, you're not working, you know, every single minute of every day. So I really kind of had to learn to give myself grace when sometimes I'm just not that productive um, and kind of learn how to get myself productive, which means maybe taking a step away for a couple hours, doing some laundry, going for a walk. Um, and so that's kind of been the hardest thing. And honestly, I'm actively still trying to deal with it, but I, I'm happy to say it's, I've come a long way in, in that respect. That's great. Congratulations on that too. And yeah. I think we can all probably relate where in our lives we wanted to sort of pivot or needed a change. Was there an aha moment um, from your part where you're like, this is it. I'm going to go full time just focusing on this. Yep. So actually when we, Mara had launched three years ago, totally different business, um, same mission, different business. Had a lot of learnings from that. And then around the time of like late 2020, is when we really came up with the idea of the app, and that's when we, or we thought we wanted to do an app. Um, and so I kind of, you know, we had been working on it all 2021. Um, I really felt passionately that we kind of like hit the sweet spot. And so I kind of arbitrarily set out this time for myself to like leave my job and just do this. Well, that time came and went, and I was like, this is mortifying. Um, why did I do that? So I had to meet with a ton of people to say, how on earth do I actually get myself to leave my job? Um, and you know, one of the best pieces of advice I ever received was figure out what you need to be comfortable to make this happen. And so I kind of, I fully set out a list, like my finances, where I'm gonna live, like how I'm gonna do this, um, really getting like my affairs in order, as you can say. Um, and so I set another date, and that was gonna be uh, December 2022. And in October 2022, you know, I'm getting close. I, I'm still feeling really revved up at this time, because I was like, okay, I hit 
everything I wanted to do, I'm going to quit. Um, my company that I worked at actually fully got acquired, and then they laid everyone off. So I was actually handed an end date that day. And so I kind of was like, all right, understood. I will, I will do it. So it was a very interesting uh, batch of events that kind of led me to do it. Yeah, I think in, in terms of like every, when people say everything happens for a reason, yep. I feel like that was sort of the moment when you're like, okay, this yep. is the universe telling me that this is the time. Exactly. And it was like, you don't have to quit your job. You've been laid off. So no problem. <laughs> Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit in terms of bringing on advisors, yep. giving away equity mm-hmm. of your company. So post-immerse, we know you've been working on bringing more industry expertise to your team. Can you share us a little bit about, you know, with the audience as to why or what's been sort of going through your mind? Yeah, so... Um Two advisors. Uh, the first one we have, um, we really met her very organically. It was just kind of networking um, with people. And I did not actually meet with her the first time with the thought that I was going to bring her on as an advisor. I just wanted to get to know her. She was in the beauty tech space. Um, and the conversation we had was I just felt like so kind of like jazzed up by her and her energy. And she just got it. Like she was without me even having to describe, you know, where I saw our company in 10 years, she was already telling me like, oh, you can do this and you can do this and you can do this. And I was like, oh my gosh, she totally gets it. Um, And so I kind of just started meeting with her and she met my whole team. And she was just, again, just giving us all this advice. Like she's really thinking down the line how she can fall in line. Um, And that's kind of when we made the thought, we were kind of like, we kind of want to bring her on. Like, she's already so invested in what we're doing, and she already was so incredibly helpful to us, um, really putting us, like, meeting a lot of important people through her, connecting us to a lot of things. Um, And so we made the decision to actually bring her on, and she is a formal advisor. She advises a lot of startups, and she actually owns an incubator herself. So she was very happy uh, to, to, to join our team. Um, And the second person, this is someone we're actually actively looking for now. Um, So if you're a cosmetic chemist, hit me up. (laughs) Um, But we just realized that, you know, we're building a science-based tool. I am not a cosmetic chemist. And I, you know, we're doing what we can. We do a lot of research. I read a lot of scientific articles. um, And we're kind of building a framework. But at the end of the day, we really do need an expert in this field to really help us kind of beef up our algorithms a lot more. Um, And quite frankly, to just be taken seriously when I actually want to go out for funding eventually. Um, So that's kind of why now we realize, like, this is someone who is going to be incredibly important to, especially this stage, but as we even grow um, in that scientific space. So that is definitely why we chose to to kind of bring someone on in that capacity. That totally makes sense. And it sounds like it's, you know, a mix of the expertise in the field, having that connection being passionate about yep. the brand and the product yep. to form trust. Exactly. Because we, you know, we've said this, we don't want like a team of 15 advisors. I don't want to keep doing this. I really want to just bring on a few really core people who can grow with the business. And so it's definitely, we, passion is like a big, big thing that we were looking for. Yeah, that's a really great advice. Um, so it looks like the judges are done deliberating. And we are ready to announce our Immerse winners for today's cohort. So thank you, Obi. Yeah, thank you. Um, for being here and being part of BubbleCon. And then do you want to just share the judges, I mean, the, the audience, how they can get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. So we are actually actively looking for a developer to partner with us. So um, if you want to collaborate, you can just reach out um, at info at And if you are also curious and want to download our beta, you can also do that and just go to www.themara.com. Thank you so much. And Obi will also be um, in the virtual booth as well. Yep. Um, and you can log in on that on Hopin. And I will be handing it off to Nicole, um, if we're ready. Oh, to Emmanuel to announce the winners. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So it's this time of the evening where we're going to talk about who are and announce our finalists um, and our grand prize winners. So, Emmanuel, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Well, first of all, uh, to our finalists, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, prepare everything. Like, this was really impressive. And whether you win or not, and, you know, not everyone is going to win, 
uh, just know that you know, we're here to support you and we do whatever we can uh, to keep supporting you because ultimately your success with your ventures uh, or nonprofit is our success. So that's something that I keep repeating to the Bubble team. This is really what we're here for. Now, we, don't, we have some winners. So I'll start with um, for the first prize for the community favorite, um, Deb, congratulations. <laughs> Next, uh, I'm proud to announce that the best product goes to Anna. <laughs> and last, the grand prize uh, for the best speech will go to Baish. All right, let's give everyone here another round of applause. Truly, great job, everyone. Great job. Okay. All right. Okay, Vaish. All right. Congratulations again, Vaish. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right, thank you all so much. All right, so to everyone that's here, we want to thank you all so much for the time and effort. First of all, coming all the way to New York City, and then second of all, voting and participating because we truly are a community. And so I want to just wrap up by saying a couple things. One, if you're tuning in online, please go and check out our expo. We have another round of fantastic finalists who are going to be presenting and debuting their apps for the very first time, so please check them out. Secondly, if you're a product mentor, um, or if you are a product developer and you've been building a bubble for some time, please sign up to be a product mentor. Truly, all four of our finalists here tonight did not get here without their product mentors, some of them of which they've shouted out. So please, if you're interested, come talk to me. Come talk to Zane on their MERS team, and let's have a conversation about that. Third, please join the mentor network um, as a guest speaker. And lastly, if you're interested, sign up to, um, to, to debut in our, our Winter 2024 cohort. So... That wraps up day one, everyone. Congrats to all the winners. Make sure you check out the virtual booths and actually the verbal certification team. Um, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you tomorrow for the keynote. All right, we'll see you at the happy hour. Bye.